Well, good evening. Let's uh, begin to discuss uh, exercises. Just one comment about the one exercise we discussed. Um, it was quite a conceptual exercise uh, consisting of studying what happens when we take uh, a beam of uh, spin one half particles, say uh, hydrogen atoms or electrons, and make them make them go through a standard lag device oriented along the z axis. Mm -hmm. Then a second standard lag oriented along the x axis, and finally again a standard lag along the z axis. Mm -hmm. Just a comment. Uh, this shows very clearly why, in general, incompatible observables destroy the information previously obtained. Uh, when we measure one of them, we destroy the information previously uh, obtained for the other. For instance, here, it's clear that the measurement make us, let us try to draw, Ah, no. Okay. Okay. So here we select the beam with positive eigenvalue of SZ. So we know exactly, we know precisely the value of these components. But since here the beam splits in two, and for any of these two states, um, we can put it, eh, the, the, for instance, this eigenstate can be written as 1 over square root of 2 alpha plus. Here, we have completely lost the information about Sz, eh, because here, this coefficient square is one half, same for this, so we have no idea of a set. Completely random values for a set, eh? as can be shown by measuring again a set. Eh? So this measurement destroys the information obtained by this measurement. This is the reason why, in order to specify a, a single state, we have to measure, of course, compatible observables in order to maintain, to keep the information in the successive measurements, okay? Well, let's go back to the other exercise. <coughs> well, exercise 11 uh, is a study of uh, um, a rigid rotor of two particles. It could be, for instance, the rotational energy of a diatomic molecule. <coughs> uh, in classical mechanics, we can express the total, well, the rotational energy in terms of the angular momentum, the rotational angular momentum. And uh, so it's straightforward to write the Hamiltonian and to and let's try to obtain the spectrum, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> uh, since the Hamiltonian is a function of L square, it has the same eigenvectors as L square. Eh? And we know that the eigenvectors of L square fulfill this eigenvalue equation where L is uh, an integral quantum number, and uh, these eigenvalues are degenerate with respect to the to a second quantum number that identifies the z component of the uh, angular momentum. Mm -hmm. So, well, I have here these um, atomic unities. Mm -hmm. So, h bar is taken as one okay, in atomic unities. I assume that you have already used at atomic unities. Well, if not, in atomic unities, we define a series of, of constants having one 
atomic unit. This is the h bar is the unit of angular momentum. Uh, the electron mass is the unit of mass. The electron charge in absolute value is the unit of charge, etc. And uh, also in atomic units, the factor one over four p epsilon sub zero sub zero is is one. Mm -hmm. But with this, we can obtain any other. For instance, the heart rate unit of energy, the bore unit of length, etc. Well, uh, then <clears throat> if we look to the definition of a function of an operator, a function of L square should have the same eigenvectors, but yeah, so if we write the eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian, we can use the same eigenvectors, but the eigenvalue is obtained by taking by applying this function to the eigenvalue of L square. And so immediately we have the eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian. In this case, it's so trivial. The Hamiltonian is a constant times L square. So we can here apply L square to this function and we obtain this and then multiply by the constant. So we can, in fact, it's not necessary to think about spectral decomposition and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, there is the same type of degeneracy that was in L square. Every, uh, every eigenvalue has a degeneracy which is 2L plus 1. The numbers, the number of values that can take M, and that's because the energy is independent on M. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> second question. Let's have a look. Um, write the spectral decomposition. Ah, well, write the spectral decomposition of the Hamiltonian and then the spectral decomposition of this operator, which is a function of the Hamiltonian. Let's go. Hamiltonian, the spectral decomposition, is a sum over all the eigenvalues of the product of the eigenvalues the each eigenvalue multiplied by the corresponding projector on the associated eigenspace. Since the eigenvalue is 2L plus 1 degenerate, we have here a sum with 2L plus 1 terms that contains the projectors over all the eigenstates or the all the eigenvectors corresponding to a given eigenvalue. So this is the spectral decomposition of the Hamiltonian. The spectrum, of course, is completely um, discrete mm -hmm. and positive. <coughs> well, uh, then we want to obtain the spectral decomposition of this function of the Hamiltonian by definition of the function of, a, of an operator, we have the same, the same eigenvector, so the same spectral decomposition, but the numbers here are functions of the energies EL. Yeah? EL. Mm? So this is the expression, the spectral decomposition, in the same basis vector, basis vector as the Hamiltonian. And finally, the, the other question was to write the density operator for any of those rotors at a given temperature. The density operator is the sum of all possible pure states multiplied by the corresponding probability. But we know that at thermodynamic, thermodynamic equilibrium, the probability of each state is given by the Boltzmann law. So these are the Boltzmann terms, which in fact 
depends only on L, and so this probability can be put outside the sum over L, and we obtain exactly the same result that was previously obtained. So these two operators are the same. So we have found that the density operator for the for uh, say a gas of rotors at, at a given temperature is the exponential of minus the Hamiltonian divided by kT and everything divided by the partition function z, which is nothing but the sum of the of all the Boltzmann terms, which is in fact a normalization constant and that makes the sum of probabilities take the value one, mm -hmm. as you already know. Well, in fact, this exercise could have been done for any Hamiltonian, at least any Hamiltonian with discrete spectrum, mm -hmm. mm, say, So, in fact, the result is completely general. If instead of putting here the rotational Hamiltonian, we put any other Hamiltonian, we obtain exactly the same result. For any macroscopic system made of independent particles, we assume that we have a collection of system here, a collection of diatomic molecules at some temperature, but for any um, for any system at, at a certain temperature, the density operator at equilibrium, at thermodynamic equilibrium, is the ex this function of the Hamiltonian. Okay? Well, if you have any question, of course, interrupt me. Here. Let's go. Um, ah, there were more. There were more more questions. Let me see. Yeah, which is see which is the state of one of the rotors after um, measuring the energy with the result zero. Mm -hmm. Zero is the lowest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. What happens? to the density operator after this measurement. Well, let's apply the fourth postulate, the collapse postulate, and see what happens. This is the enunciate of the collapse postulate. In this case, the ground state, the state with zero energy, is non-degenerated. And so the projector is simply the projector over a single basis vector. Mm -hmm. Then we put here the density operator before the measurement, and this is the normalization constant, the trace. And then in the numerator, here, for instance, we have that this scalar product is zero except for the first term in the double sum for the term zero zero, because the basis set can be chosen orthonormal. In fact, it must be orthonormal because any any pair of vectors have a difference in L or in M, so they are they must be eigen vectors of some Hamiltonian with different eigenvalue. So this basis set is necessarily orthonormal, well, orthogonal, and can be normalized, of course. And so this is zero except for the term here, zero, zero. And uh, of course, the same happens if I multiply this by this. And so this double sum disappears, and we are led only with the projector over the ground state eigenvector of the ground state, multiplied by P0. And in the denominator, 
we have seen that when we have a trace of a product of a projector and any other operator, we can formally take this cat and put it here, and then it's equivalent to write this uh, expected value. And again, if we put here the sum over every state in the density operator, we are led that finally the only non-vanishing term is the first one. And then we obtain here the probability for the first, for the ground state, times 1, because the states are normalized. And then we can simplify. And in fact, we obtain a result that we already knew, because we had uh, proved it in general that when the measurement gives a non-degenerate eigenvalue for some operator, then the result of the measurement is the corresponding pure state, no matter which was the state, pure or mixed state, previous to the measurement. And finally, <clears throat> what happens if I measure the energy in, a certain, in one of these rotors and obtain the result, this result, which, if we have a look to the general expression, is the energy corresponding to L equal 1, is the first excited level. 1, 2, well, 1 by 2, simplified with the 2, and we obtain the result. Well, this is a triply degenerate eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, and so the projector now contains three terms, the sum of the state 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, minus 1, here and here. And this is the projector over E and same for this. Well, so here, from in this, in the sum that defines a row, we have three surviving terms, the three terms corresponding to L equal 1. And since the three have the same probability, because the probability only depends on L, this probability can be put outside the sum. And in the denominator, same, same thing. We have terms like this one for the three states corresponding to L equal 1. And the three have the same probability, P1. So at the end, the, we can simplify P1, and we obtain 1 over 3. 1 over 3 multiplied by the sum of the three projectors of these states. So now, the result of the measurement is a mixed state. But a mixed state in which we have much more information than in the initial state. Because here, we have a mixture of three states. And at the beginning, we had a mixture of many states. OK? <clears throat> well, this is rather intuitive. Eh? Uh, since at the end of a measurement, we, we must have well-defined the property we have measured, the uh, mixture, the most general mix, mixture state in which we know that the energy takes the value E1 must be, must contain these three projectors. And if we are in isotropic conditions, it is clear that the three projector should have projectors should, should have the same probability. So this result can be previewed quite easily. Okay. Well, uh, here I have another maybe simpler way. You have any question? No, 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 because 
the normalization constant for a wave function is normally one divided the square of the number of states because uh, the square of the coefficients must, must add to one. But here, these are directly probabilities. We have not to square them. In the density operator, directly, the coefficients must add one. Okay? Um, it's somewhat different as in the case of pure states, of vector states. Okay? You see, no? OK. Well, here I have obtained the same result uh, using a, a slightly different notation. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, without ex expressing, expanding this operator, we, we can put here directly projector over E1, projector over E1, and density operator. Yeah? And same here. And since the projectors are orthogonal, projectors onto two different spaces give zero. And so again, this product, for instance, well, this product is zero except for L equal one. And since projectors are, are idempotent, we have here the product of three projectors, P1, 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 which is P1. Yeah? And then the small p, which is the probability, and the uh, same thing in the denominator. From this sum, the only surviving term is L equal 1. And then we obtain the, since again we use the idempotency of the projector, we obtain the trace of P1 multiplied by P. In order to calculate this trace, for instance, uh, well, the, the, the small p's are numbers can be simplified, a number can be taken outside the trace. If we multiply a matrix by a number, the, the trace is multiplied by that number. And then we have the trace of this project, of this sum of projectors. If we again make the trick of putting this here, because this can be considered as the product of a projector times the unit operator. We put it I, we put it here, the ket, and then since the vectors are normalized, this is three. In fact, it can really be shown that the trace of a projector is the dimension of the space onto which the projector projects. This is a projector over a three-dimensional space. Its trace is three. And this can be readily generalized for any n-dimensional subspace. Well, any question? Let's go on. <coughs> OK. Um, I, ah, no, no. This, this exercise was not. Well, this exercise, I have changed a little bit. The exercise 113, I have uh, split it into two exercises in order to separate uh, an exercise that deals with the evolution of a pure state. And then we will see a second exercise that deals with the evolution of mixed states. Um, try to have a look to this exercise for next day, only this. Eh? We will discuss it, but try to do it, which is nothing but a direct application of what we have seen for the evolution of pure states. Okay. Well, let's now see how do a mixed state evolve. Well, mm, well, sorry. Uh, in this state, in this um, exercise, uh, we are asked 
to compare the result with classical uh, with the classical solution of the problem. Uh, here we, we we will study the spin of a carbon-13 nucleus under a magnetic field, static magnetic field that points to the z-axis, and we will see that the expected value of the magnetic moment or the, of the, of the angular moment, which are proportional vectors, has a precession motion around B0, rotates around B0. And the speed and the characteristics of this motion is exactly to the solution of the classical problem. Uh, the only difference is that in classical mechanics, we speak of the, of the vector. And here, we must speak of the expected value of the vector. But the expected value moves exactly the same kind of motion as in classical mechanics. And here, I had a brief review of what happens in classical mechanics. Yeah? In classical mechanics, the Newton law applied to a rotating system can be written this way. The derivative of the angular momentum with respect to its time is the torque of the forces acting on the system. And uh, if the system is, is a magnetic moment with an applied static uh, magnetic field, then the torque is given, as you probably know, as the vector product of these two vectors. On the other hand, the magnetic moment of a rotating particle is proportional to the angular moment of the motion, and the proportionality constant is called the zero magnetic ratio. And uh, it can be, well, for instance, for a rotating particle, it can be shown that this is the charge of the particle divided by two times the mass. And uh, I think that's, that's all, well, in general, for any charge. Well, um, if we put this here, we have a differential equation that gives us, which is the evolution of L. The, the, the change of L with time is given by the product of these two vectors, the, the vector product. Yeah? And the vector product is perpendicular to both of them. So the, the, the vector L changes always in a direction perpendicular to L and perpendicular to B0. For instance, if B0 is in the z-axis, and let's say that we start with the angular momentum or the magnetic moment in this direction, the, the change is perpendicular. And a change that is always perpendicular to the vector is uh, gives a circular motion. Yeah? And this is the typical precession motion around B0. Mm -hmm. so, this, is, this can be shown in more mathematical terms. You can have a look to this reference I wrote many years ago. And uh, you can see that the vector L, or the vector mu, rotate around B0 with angular speed minus gamma B0. OK? Well, the question is that you have to you have to study in terms of quantum mechanics, and, to, and you will reach the same conclusion, but for expected values. Well, in fact, here I have assumed that delta is positive, so omega is negative, and the sense of rotation is this one. Some nuclei have positive gamma or negative gamma, and then the rotation is the other way around, but this makes, this is not important. 
Well, try to do it and let's see what happens with mixed states. If we have a mixed state expressed as usual as a sum of probabilities times projectors over pure states, Com uh, as we know which is the evolution of the pure state, we can put here in this cat, we can put the time evolution operator times the initial vector and say th same thing here. And since these evolution operators do not depend on the index i, they can be put outside the sum. Same thing here, but with a adjoint because it's a bra. And then we obtain this equation for the time evolution of any density operator. So again, all we need to know is the time evolution operator. Um, by taking the derivative with respect, with respect to t and using the differential equation that fulfills the evolution operator, uh, we can derive the three terms and then it's very straightforward to obtain a differential equation for the density operator, which in fact is equivalent to this equation. Okay? The first one, in fact, is formally the solution of the second one. Mm -hmm. This is, in fact, a direct consequence of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. It is sometimes called the Liouville von Neumann equation because it was first written by von Neumann and it's rather parallel to the Liouville equation of classical mechanics, but in fact is the direct consequence of Schrodinger equation applied to mixed states. We have seen that for a system in macroscopic system in equilibrium, thermodynamic equilibrium, the density operator is a function of the Hamiltonian. Therefore, in those circumstances, this is zero because h always commutes with any function of h, and so this derivative is zero, and so as could be <laughs> expected, the density operator of uh, system in equilibrium is time independent. Well, um, since we have only two days until the next class, we leave this for the other week. Yeah? So this exercise, if you have time, you can have a look. If not, we can leave it for, for after the, the bridge, <laughs> the long bridge. Well, let's go on. Time evolution pictures. <clears throat> we have we have said several times that all we can predict with quantum mechanics is expected values of Hermitian operators. And in the formulation of the postulates, we have assumed that the operators are in general time independent except for very special cases, as the Hamiltonian of a non-isolated Hamilton uh, system, and that the evolution is due to a change of the state vectors with times. But this is rather artificial, because we could have chosen the other way around things. We, ca we could have think of, uh, thought of operators that are that change with time and state vectors that are time independent. And this is perfectly equivalent and perfectly valid option. And in fact, when quantum mechanics were independently uh, proposed by Heisenberg and Schrodinger, Schrodinger made the first assumption, the first election cho choice, and Heisenberg made the second one. So we can do we can use two different ways of formulating quantum mechanics 
that led to the same expected values. And so here, of course, I have well, I have add a sub-index to indicate if we are dealing with the Schrodinger time evolution picture or the Heisenberg time evolution picture. How do we define the Heisenberg time evolution picture? The idea is very simple. We take the state vectors in the Schrodinger picture and apply to them the inverse of the adjoint, which is the same, of the time evolution operator, and then we obtain the corresponding vector in Heisenberg picture, which is nothing but the Schrodinger operator in the initial time, in, a, in an arbitrarily chosen time in which both uh, both pictures coincide. Okay. Well, by definition, this is the way we define vector states in Heisenberg picture. How do we find? How do we define? operators in Heisenberg picture? Well, the question is that we have to take a definition such that the expected values are the same. And it is straightforward to see that the definition is this one. We take the operator in the Redinger, in the Redinger picture. In general, it should be time independent, but I made I make it here completely general, and I multiply on the left-hand side by u dagger, on the right-hand side by u. If we put here, if we put, if we substitute this definition here and this definition here, it's a straightforward. I leave you as an exercise to show that both expected values coincide. Okay. Um, of course, in the Heisenberg picture, the equivalent of the Rengel equation, the Heisenberg equation, should be an equation that gives the evolution of the operators. And by differentiating this with time and using the equation that we know for the derivative of u of the time evolution operator, it's straightforward to write the time evolution equation in the Heisenberg picture. And uh, if you remember which was the general definition of a constant of motion, a constant of motion was uh, an observable that is time independent in any state of the system. And we found that mathematically, for a constant, for a, an observable A to be a constant of motion, this should be zero. And so we found that in the Heisenberg picture, the idea of constant of motion is very intuitive and very simple. Time derivative of the corresponding operator equals Mm, well, it's, it's interesting because, in fact, in, in a certain way, Heisenberg picture is more intuitive than, than Schrodinger picture because they are the observables that change in time, not the, the state which is a very abstract thing in quantum mechanics. For instance, it's really seen that in Heisenberg picture you can write the the Newton law, uh, well, no, no, the the relationship between momentum and position operators is exactly the same as in classical mechanics. The momentum operator can be written as the time derivative of the position operator, that is the velocity operator, multiplied by the mass. Mm -hmm. We can obtain an equation for operators. We can introduce a force operator that fulfills exactly the second Newton law. In electromagnetic radiation, for instance, 
electric and magnetic fields um, are associated to operators that fulfills that fulfill the Maxwell equation exactly the same as in classical mechanics. So it's uh, but in some in some instances is uh, is interesting to to know it. Um, well, let's look for instance that for a mixed state the expected value also are the same in both pictures. For instance, the expected value in, in a mixed state in the Rodinger picture is given by this trace. And here, if we use the equation of the evolution well, that we have just deduced the equation for the evolution of the density operator. Uh, no, sorry. This is the density operators in, in terms of uh, operator in terms of time. And then if we take this operator and use the possibility of taking cyclic permutations without changing the trace, then we put it here. And what we obtain is just the expression of the Heisenberg version of the operator yeah, in terms of the Schrodinger version. Yeah. And so we obtain the same equation in the Heisenberg picture. <clears throat> okay. Well, and why why should we assign the evolution, the time evolution, completely to the vector states or completely to the operators? Why not be more democratic and make both of them participate in the evolution? This, of course, can be done. In fact, there are an infinity of evolution pictures that can be used because there are many ways of distributing the evolution between these two tools, operators, well, operators and uh, state vectors. And in fact, in, in the case, for instance, that we are studying a system that interacts with something external, for instance, the interaction between radiation and matter, when we use a semi-classical approach in which we describe classically the, the electromagnetic radiation, then the system has a Hamiltonian which is which has a constant term, which is the Hamiltonian for the isolated uh, system, and then a term, a term that includes the dependence on time. And for those systems, it's quite convenient to use an intermediate picture, also called the Dirac picture, or the interaction picture, in which we take the cats of the Schrodinger picture and take out the part of the evolution due to H0. Since H0 is time independent, the time evolution picture has a simple expression as, as this exponential. And then we obtain a cat in the Dirac picture that only, that of course is time dependent, but the only dependency is that due of the, the is uh, that produced by the perturbation, the time dependent perturbation H prime. So this is rather convenient because the evolution is only due to the interaction term. We have taken out this trivial evolution 
due to the uh, isolated system Hamiltonian. Well, we normally work in the Rodinger picture, but for instance, for to study radiation, the Heisenberg picture is quite convenient, and also sometimes for a study radiation matter interaction. Okay. <clears throat> OK, here we have an exercise that I leave it also for, for the long week, the long bridge, which is to study the same problem of a spin that rotates around the magnetic field, but to study it in the Rodinger picture and to see that the vectors really rotate around the static field in a quite similar way as the corresponding classical problem. Well, let's go to the final postulate. The final sixth postulate deals with compound systems, and uh, it has two parts. First, two parts, the Hilbert space associated to a system made of two or more parts is the direct product of the Hilbert space associated to each part. Two parts can be two particles, two groups, two, two sets of particles, or even sometimes we can divide the, the CSCO, the observables, in two sets and consider one part of the system mm, defined as a collection of properties and one part with a different collection of independent properties. Well, in fact, I, I refer, for instance, when you consider a system without and with spin. The inclusion of the spin in a previous study of a system, for instance, of the hydrogen atom in which we have not considered the spin, can be the, the effect of the spin can be included by expanding the Hilbert space in order to take into account the spin. And also, this suspension is made through the direct product. We will now define which is this type of product. Mm -hmm. So, if we have two systems and put them together, it's very easy to build the Hilbert space of the complete system from the individual Hilbert spaces of the parts. Moreover, if two of these parts are identical particles, the state vectors of the compound system must be symmetric or antisymmetric with respect to the change of the levels of those two particles depending on their spin quantum number being integer or half odd. Half odd, of course, means half an odd integer is one half, three half, etc. Well, uh, some remarks. Um, this second part, in fact, uh, can be demonstrated, can be proven in a wider frame, which is uh, in relativistic quantum field theory. Yeah, so there is a theorem that is the spin statistics theorem that allows to connect symmetry and antisymmetry with the mm, bosonic or fermionic character of the particles. You know that particles with integer spin are called bosons, particles with half odd spin are called fermions. Mm -hmm. Second remark, uh, very use, uh, it's very useful to to treat as a particle a system which is made of several particles. For instance, in chemistry, we normally treat the nucleus of the molecules as particles when, in fact, we know that they are made of protons and neutrons or quarks. But in any case, uh, the energies that are exchanged in chemical processes are not enough to excite to change the state of a nucleus. And so 
in what regards chemistry, nuclei can be considered as structureless particles. The structure is not changed in those processes, and also the size of the system is very, very small. It's four orders of magnitude smaller than a hydrogen atom, and then we can perfectly consider them as particles. And then, in this case, we use the word spin for referring to the total angular momentum of the particles inside the, in this case, inside the nucleus. And this particle, every particle has its uh, spin and orbital angular momenta, and then the sum of all of these is what we call the spin. Of course, you know that if a nucleus is excited, the total angular momentum can change and the spin can change. But when we say that the spin of a chloride nucleus is 3 over 2, we of course refer to the total angular momentum in the nuclear ground state, which is a useful state for the atom. <clears throat> in statistical mechanics, for instance, very often we treat complete atoms as single particles, and then the spin of the atom is the total angular momentum, the J, eh? the sum of electronic, orbital, and spin angular momenta. OK? Well, what is a direct product? A direct, tensorial, Kronecker, this is equivalent ways of naming this product. If we have two Hilbert spaces, we define this, the direct product of these two Hilbert spaces as a new space in which to every, every pair of vectors of the two product spaces, we assign a new vector, which is written that way, or sometimes that way. Mathematicians normally use the first notation. Physicists and chemists normally use the second notation without the symbol. Mm. To start with it, I will use the symbol because things become maybe more clear. And then I will drop it in a, after some slides. Eh? And well, this product is bilinear. That means that. If we have here, here or here a linear combination of vectors, we obtain the corresponding linear combination of products. Mm -hmm. um, and then, if we have a basis set in H1 and a basis set in H2, the collection of all of these products is a basis set in the direct product of the spaces. That means that any vector in the product space can be put as a linear combination of those products. Of course, it follows that the dimension of the product space is the product of the dimensions of the space we are multiplying, eh? because the number of elements here is the product of the number of elements in the two bases. And one more thing, we defined a scalar product in the product space in this way. If we have two vectors expressed as direct product of vectors of the two spaces, we have to take the product of the first by the first and the second by the second. These are no complex numbers, so then can, we can use the ordinary product for them. Well, this is the definition of the direct product. Um, <clears throat> we can also define direct products of operators. And the definition is very simple. If I have 
an operator acting on H1 and an operator acting on H2, then the direct product operator applied to a given product is defined that way. We take the product of the first one applied to the first vector, direct product with the second operator applied to the second vector. Okay. Can you see these, these boxes? If I, I assume you can see them, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, um, because when I use, when I write, letters disappear and it's quite boring. Well, um, of course, these are not the only operators that can act in the product space. The more general way, the more general operator, however, can be put as a linear combination of such products. So, in fact, this we can have a basis set in the Hilbert space of the operators, and this is a basis, and this is the expression of any operator in the product space. An operator acting on the first space can be viewed as an operator in the whole space by multiplying by the identity operator of in the second space. Yeah? And this, I have used this notation, I have put, in fact, this and this are mathematically different entities. This operates in H1 and, and no, this operates in H1 and this operates in the product, but in fact, Normally, we use the same notation for both of them. Yeah? And uh, it is clear, it's really very straightforward to verify that an operator acting on H1 commutes with any operator acting on H2. Yeah? Well, let's go on. Operators I have named separable operators, operators that are the sum of one operator of H1 and one operator of H2. And uh, if we have the eigenvalue equation for the first and second one, it's very straightforward to verify that the products of one eigenvector of H1 times one eigenvector of uh, B2 is an eigenvector of the sum A plus B with eigenvalue the sum of the corresponding eigenvalues. And this gives a simple way of studying systems that can be separated in simpler systems. For instance, you already probably know that the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator has a Hamiltonian that can be put at the sum of three terms that are exactly equal to the Hamiltonians of one-dimensional dimen uh, oscillators. And so we can use the solution of the one-dimensional oscillator to write eh, by multiplying any three fun, uh, state vectors of one dimensional oscillators in the axis x, y, z, and with constant kx, ky, and kz, we obtain the eigenvectors of the complete Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. Same thing for the three dimensional box, mm -hmm. can be put in terms of it can be separated in three terms that are mathematically exactly the same thing as the Hamiltonian of one-dimensional boxes. And so the 
eigenstates of the three-dimensional box can be written as product of eigenstates of one-dimensional boxes in the three axes. And I already have mentioned that, for instance, the hydrogen atom, if we study the atom without considering the spin, and then we add the spin, we can consider, even for a non-relativistic Hamiltonian, we can consider that the Hamiltonian is a sum of the non-relativistic Hamiltonian, which is spin-independent, and a zero operator of the spin coordinates, of the spin observables, square and etc. And so, of course, this is uh, the, the, pro, the, the Hilbert space of the, of the states of those Hamilton, of this Hamiltonian, can be put as direct products of spatial and spin states. And finally, when we study a polyelectronic system by using approximate functions of this type of uh, that are later determinants, uh, in fact, these functions are eigenfunctions, for instance, in the Hartree-Fock method, uh, later determinant, in fact, is a product of eigenfunctions of Fock operators with the coordinates of electron 1, 2, 3, that is an approximate Hamiltonian which should be the sum of n Fock operators. Later determinants are, in fact, products of one eigenfunction of this operator times one of this, times one of this, and the only thing here is that we have to add an operator in order to anti-symmetrize these products. We will discuss these anti-symmetrizers uh, in the second part of the, of the class. Well, let's take a 10 minutes break and uh, we will continue. Okay? <coughs> let's pause. Now, okay, okay, sorry, I had, I had taken out the, the sound. Uh, let's go back. <clears throat> we were talking that uh, that uh, this idea of um, of taking the product, the direct product of Hilbert spaces, allows to study complex systems by studying different parts of the system first and then combining the corresponding solutions. <clears throat> well, let's go on. Um, when we consider several systems with several parts, in particular, let's let's think of several particles, which is the simplest case. We can have a connection between the parts that is very striking in quantum mechanics, which is called entanglement. Well, in the previous today, I have changed the title of this slide because I had here. Correlated, correlated versus non-correlated states. And uh, entanglement and correlation are, are very related concepts, but I think they are not exactly equivalent. So I have, I have preferred to put entangled and non-entangled states. I, I will discuss w the difference uh, later on. <clears throat> Let's first consider what we call a non-entangled state. We have a two-particle system, and we have a state vector, which is the direct product of a state vectors of each particle, of either particle. <coughs> well, in this case, it's really seen that, for instance, if we are interested in a property of particle one, 
then we take the operator corresponding of that property, multiply it by the identity operator of particle 2 in order to extend this operator to the product space, and then we take the expected value in, uh, I assume that that is a pure state of this type. Then we have seen that this operator acts on the first ket, this operator acts on the first, on the second ket, and then we have to take the product of the f of everything that corresponds to particle one and everything that corresponds to particle two. So the result, since for particle two we have the identity operator and uh, this by normalization the scalar product of these two uh, vectors is one, we obtain just the expected value in the state of particle one. So, in fact, we can completely describe particle one by using this term of the product. Any property of particle one can be calculated without using the vector of particle two. Even for, for properties that belong to both particles but can be put as a product, as a tensor product or direct product of one operator of particle one times one operator of, of particle two, even in this case, we can calculate the, the, the part of the property that corresponds to particle one and to particle two independently. Mm -hmm. So we can really associate a pure state to each of the two particles. Mm -hmm. What happens if we have a state which cannot be put as a product of a state of particle one times state of particle two. In general, it, it can be put, as we have seen, as a linear combination because these are these terms are a basis set, then any state can be put that way. I can assume that the basis set is orthonormal and let's again calculate a property of particle one. Well, same thing is the expected value of the state vector, state vector, and here the operator. And uh, since, again, since for particle two we have the identity operator, we can multiply this by this, and this is zero except when L equals K. So we can take out the sum over L and then <coughs> And then we are left, we, we can put all the indexes L equal to K. And if we take out the sum over J, we see that we have here a vector of particle one, here the same vector for particle two and the operator for particle one and the operator in the space, Hilbert space of particle one. So, I define this, this and this are exactly the same because the, the index in the sum is a dummy index. And so, I have this result. Well, and these vectors are not normalized, so I can multiply and divide by the sum of the square of the coefficients. These vectors are not normalized because I, because here I have a sum over no here I have not a sum over all the couples of indexes i j I have a sum only over i and so I have not the complete sum of the coefficient of the squares of the coefficients eh? well uh, I mean the sum of the square of the coefficients here should be less than one because here the sum is one. 
here I have less terms. Uh, but I can normalize by dividing and multiplying by the norm and including it in the coefficients. I redefine the vectors and well, it's a straightforward thing to, to write this final expression, but I, here in terms of normalized gets normalized vectors for particle one. So even if the two particles are in the pure state, the only way of obtaining the properties of particle one, one of them, is to consider that particle one, in fact, is in some mixed state because, in fact, the expected values are just the expression for expected value in a mixed state. It's a, a sum of expected values of a collection of pure states weighted with these probabilities. Um, later on, we will, we will see a systematic way of uh, of calculating the uh, density operator that describes particle one. But for the moment, the, it's enough to realize that we cannot, in this state, we cannot assign to particle one a vector, a pure state. The only way of obtaining the properties of particle one is as uh, some as uh, as if the particle were in a collection of possible pure states with probabilities pj. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we say that the particles are in an entangled state. In the first case, we say that the particles are in a non-entangled state. In a non-entangled state, each particle has its own state vector. In an entangled state, this is not the case. The state vectors uh, combine the two particles, and the only way to assign a state to individual particles is as mixed states. So again, the density operator formalis is much more powerful than the state vector formalis because it can lead not only with completely determinate states and partially determinate states, but it can also deal with systems which are entangled because, for instance, a previous interaction with another system and we can define the state of a system even if it is entangled with another system. We will, we will, de we will see, we will discuss this in detail in the lesson number three, which deal with reduced density operators. In fact, we will see that the way to assign a operator, a density operator to particle one is by means of what we will call a reduced, a single particle reduced density operator, which in fact is the same thing as the one order density matrices you have seen in quantum chemistry books. Well, for the moment, let, let's discuss entanglement from a physical point of view. Let's consider that we have a system with two particles in an entangled state, the same type of state we have just introduced. And let's assume that the free evolution lets the particle were very separated and uh, after sent, uh, sent, uh, well, so they no longer interact. Okay? One of the particles goes to Andromeda and the other particles with the other part of the universe. And in one of the particles, we make a measurement. For instance, we measure 
property A in particle 1, and we obtain, say, a non-degenerate value AK. What happens to the state vector? Well, the, the pair of particles were in this pure state, and the, the collapse of a pure state is obtained by applying the projector onto the eigenspace corresponding to the obtained result. In this case, it's a one-dimensional eigenspace because this is non-degenerated. If we, if we apply this projector, we take the product, the scalar product of these two, and of course, this is zero except for the cases with j equal k. So the sum over j, uh, no, sorry, no, is the first index. The, the, the index that corresponds to particle 1 is i. Uh, so the sum over i disappears, and we are left with only the sum over j. Okay? When i coincides with k, the scalar product is 1, and then we obtain this result. The interesting point here is that, well, this is no longer an entangled state. Okay? Entanglement has been broken by the measurement, because now we have a product of a state vector of particle 1 times state vector of particle 2. But the funny thing is that the state vector of particle 2 depends on the result we have obtained for particle 1. Because here we have to sum a sum in which only the terms with index k survive. And the index k corresponds to the value we have obtained for particle 1. And this effect is instantaneous and has been verified in many, many experiments that no matter which is the distance between the two particles, a measurement made of one of them immediately, instantaneously, change the state of the second one in a way that depends on the result obtained for particle one. This is the tricky consequence of entanglement. Hmm? Uh, and this is why we say that quantum mechanics is a non-local theory. In quantum mechanics, in a certain way, as I told in the first class, we cannot sometimes isolate a system. If we have a completely isolated system, we cannot assure that there are not influences that come from systems that are maybe very far apart from mine. If the, well, in fact, entanglement is very delicate. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is English or Spanglish, I hope you understand, is it's very difficult to preserve eh? interactions with, with the uh, environment, environment destroying this. this uh, in fact, it's, it really is, in, entanglement is very interesting and has a lot of a potential, very interesting applications in quantum computing, in transmission, a way of transmitting signals in an unvolatile way. And, well, <laughs> uh, well, this will be discussed in the last session, but the fact is that it's, in general, difficult to preserve entanglement from the experimental point of view. But, in principle, you could have a system which is not, which has no type of interaction with another part, but I, but is influenced by by it, and it is the origin. This is the origin of the long discussions that have been held between, mainly between 
Einstein and Bohr, because Einstein, Einstein who was the father of relativity, um, could not believe in non-local effects. In fact, the um, uh, special relativity and the general relativity were both inspired by the by the fact he was convinced that in nature there could not exist actions at a distance. And so, for instance, this was the origin of the general relativity. Newton law, according to Newton law, if we put a planet nearby the solar system, immediately all the other planets and the sun and the moon receive the influence of the of the law because the Newton law of gravitation tells nothing about time. It's an instantaneous effect. And Einstein was convinced that it was impossible. And so he looked of, he he searched for theory in which the effect of gravity propagates in the same way that the effect of light propagates through photons. So in a certain way he predict that there should be a way of propagating what we call now uh, gravitons, that in fact uh, has recently been uh, well, not exactly gravitons, but the, this this propagation of gravity waves have been detected experimentally in recent years. But he was convinced, and so he could not accept the non-local effects that were predicted by quantum theory. Um, well, he died before that experimental facts have almost completely demonstrated that nature is really non-local. Non-locality of quantum mechanics is a property of nature, is, is really true. And uh, the funny thing is that this is not contradictory with relativity theory, because as we will see when we discuss this uh, more philosophical aspect, we will see that this quantum non-locality cannot be used for transferring no kinds of particles or even information at speeds um, larger than the speed of light. Yeah? So even if it's a non-local theory, it's completely compatible with gravity, with um, relativity, at least with special relativity. We will discuss it in the last sessions. Let us now continue. <clears throat> Well, this is an exercise in which we discussed, we discuss, uh, we will discuss uh, the triplet and singlet states of a two electron system, for instance, a helium atom, and to see which of those states are entangled and non entangled, etc. Well, another exercise. Well, when we have identical particles, the, there's an, uh, an important difference of the classical and quantum treatment of systems with identical particles. Identical particles are particles having the same intrinsic properties, mm -hmm. that is, the mass, the charge, the spin, eh? or if it is a, in a particle a quark, there are other properties, all of them define the type of particle. If the particles have the same intrinsic properties, even in this case, in, in classical mechanics, they can be distinguished. Because trajectories are, can be very well defined, in principle, perfectly defined. And so we can differentiate the particles by predicting their trajectories, by integrating the Newton law. And for instance, if we have two particles that may collide, 
we can we can look at the the position of the particles and the velocity of the particles at a certain time and then by integrating the Newton laws if we know the interaction between them we can preview if the particles were will follow these trajectories or maybe not maybe they are they become um, close enough so that they collide and at the end instead of having particle one here and particle two here maybe they collide and particle one keeps in the upper position particle two in the lower position but at any time the trajectory is perfectly defined and so can be used to differentiate the particles. We can label the particles at a given time, one, the upper one, to the lower one, and at any later time, the label is still well defined. But in quantum mechanics, the problem is that trajectories are diffuse. We cannot know at any given time the position and the velocity with complete accuracy. And so, even if they are far apart in a certain time so as to be able to, to label the particles, one and two, if the trajectories become close enough so that the distance between the particles is comparable, is in the same order as the uncertainty in their positions, then they become undistinguishable. And here we cannot know if, for instance, the particles separate after colliding. In fact, we cannot know if they have collided and follow these trajectories or they have crossed with not sufficient interaction to, to deviate the trajectories. And so here we have lost the, the label of the particles. And so, in quantum mechanics, in general, trajectories cannot be used to identify the particles, at least if the particles are not far apart from each other. Well, according to the postulate, if we have such particles, depending on the spin of the particles, the total function must be symmetric or anti-symmetric depending on the spin on the functions. Spin uh, particles with integral spins are called bosons. And then the states of a system of say n bosons cannot be any vectors of the Hilbert space which is the direct product of the Hilbert spaces of the one particle of every individual particle we have to take a subspace which is the symmetric subspace which is noted this way is the we take the direct product but only the symmetric part of the direct product okay? can be written as a, an exponent with an s of symmetric or as a collection of products of product symbols with the S. And a way of obtaining this subspace, of having a base of this subspace, is to take all the products, the, the basis set we have introduced for the direct space, to apply them all the permutation of the N elements, we can permutate the labels of the particles or the labels of the state, which is equivalent. And then the sum all of, of all of those permutated products is, of course, symmetric. Yeah? Because if we change two of these states, we obtain another permutation, which is in within the sum. And so the we only make an exchange between two terms of the sum. And so the, the complete sum becomes invariant. And uh, well, this is a normalization factor because you know that the number of permutation is the, 
is n factorial. Okay? <clears throat> well, we have a basis set. Well, here the symbol has disappeared. A basis set of this space. Hmm? And uh, similar thing can be done to obtain a basis set of the anti-symmetric space. If we have a system of n fermions, then the only thing is that in the sum we have to introduce a term which is minus 1 to the to p alpha and p alpha is the sometimes called the parity of the permutation which is defined as the number of transpositions or inversions leading from the main permutation to any other one we can always uh, define a permutation of the main one. For instance, the main permutation could be 1, 2, n. And all the permutations can be obtained by transposing pairs of indexes. Yeah? For instance, if I transpose these two, uh, transposition is a permutation of two elements. If I transpose these two, I have a new permutation which has p equal 1. Yeah? If I now make a second permutation, I obtain uh, no, sorry, a new permutation with parity 2. Yeah? And so this one should have plus in here. The first one should have a minus sign. And in this way, whenever, well, of course, this is nothing but the, what we know as a Slater determinant. Yeah? In a Slater determinant here, we normally consider that we have spin orbitals, which are the expression of the monoelectron states in coordinate uh, representation. But the same determinant could be written for direct products of vectors, of state vectors, of mono particular state vectors. And so we can write, write this way, eh, the anti-symmetrized product. <coughs> well. well, I have here an example. Eh? Uh, the direct product, the anti-symmetrized product uh, of the three particle states, a state, if the particles are fermions, well, the, there are several notations. For instance, let me go back. Here, I have added a minus to the ket to indicate that is a anti-symmetrized state. Yeah? And in the previous slide, I had added a plus in the cat to indicate that it is a symmetrized state. So this is equivalent to put the S here or the A of anti-symmetric here. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we deal with electrons, we normally do not put this because it is understood that all the cats are anti-symmetrized. Yes? Yeah? Yes. Yes, when, when I say that um, the, when, when I consider identical particles, the spin is needed because when we speak of exchange of particles, we mean exchange the complete state spatial and spin state of every particle. So in coordinate positions, this is, these are spin orbitals. Eh? We must include a spin because spin plays a very important role in anti-symmetry. In fact, the type of symmetry depends on the spin. And so when we speak of interchange of particles, monoparticles include, must include, the spin. 
In fact, there is a way of formulating all the quantum chemistry without a spin. Eh? But in fact, the spin is uh, is included in an indirect way. But at the end, we can we there is a way of calculating uh, wave functions for n particle and electron systems that are spin independent. But to build them, in fact, we have to use some properties of the spin. So a spin must always be considered when we are dealing with systems of several particles. <coughs> well, uh, well, in this example, eh? Uh, I assume that this is the main permutation, and so this is the first term has the indexes of the states in the, well, here I am permuting not the states, but the indexes of the states, not the labels of the particle, but, but the indexes. In fact, it's equivalent, but we normally assume that the first factor refers to particle one, the second to particle two, the third to particle three. And if we, if we want to keep this ordering of the particles in all the terms, we have to change the indexes of the states in, instead of the indexes of the particles, but it's equivalent. So here, for instance, I interchange J and K, and so this, Permutation must have minus sign because there is a single transposition. Now I interchange i and k, and so the sign becomes plus. A new transposition, change of sign. A new transposition, another change, and so on. And of course, if the system were made of three bosons, all the signs would be plus, and we have not to bother about the number of transpositions. Mm -hmm. This will be the state for three bosons. Mm -hmm. Well, I have here two very well-known examples in order to connect to something familiar in quantum chemistry, for instance, the closed shell, one S2 slated determinant uh, of helium <clears throat> has a state vector, which is this anti-symmetrized product of the orbitals, of the spin orbitals, one is alpha and one is beta, and we can expand it. And in this case, for two particles, we can even separate the space and the spin parts of the wave functions. Uh, everywhere we should have direct products, yeah? but normally this is, these are not written explicitly. And uh, here, same thing for an excited configuration, 1s, 2s, yeah? in which the spin part is the same because we are considering, considering a singlet state, but the spatial part, of course, is different. Yeah. Well. Uh, according to the postulate, the postulate tells nothing about whether two identical particles are interacting or not. In fact, when there is entanglement between two electrons, for instance, even if they are very separated, the total state vector must be antisymmetric with respect to the exchange of these two particles. But in fact, so when we are studying an atom, we have to bother with making the function, the state vectors antisymmetric with every other electron in the universe? Strictly speaking, the answer is yes. But fortunately, fortunately, when two particles <laughs> become uh, far apart, the inclusion of antisymmetry makes no difference 
in the resulting state. So the results we obtain for expected values without anti-symmetrizing the electrons of one atom with any other electron in the universe is the same as considering only the electrons in my atoms. Eh? In my atoms. For instance, um, if I have a hydrogen atom that in a hydro hydrogen molecule and I stretch the bond length so at the end we end with two separated electrons. When the two electrons were close together, the wave function must be uh, anti-symmetric, but if the two electrons are very far apart, in fact, we can differentiate them. Because in practice, I can say, OK, electron 1 is the one that, has, that is bounded with the left-hand side uh, nucleus, and electron 2 is the one that is bonded to the other nucleus. And since they are very well separated, in fact, in practice, we can differentiate it as we do in classical mechanics. And it's, um, it's rather straightforward to see that if the two particles, in fact, the wave functions of the two particles do not overlap significantly, then we do not have to bother about anti-symmetrizing the complete state with respect to this interchange. And same thing for nuclei. For instance, if I have a molecule with identical nuclei, the complete wave function or state vector should be anti-symmetric or symmetric with respect to interchange of to a change of nuclei, depending on the nuclear spin being integer or mm, half odd. Mm. For instance, in molecule H2, the wave function, the total wave function or total vector state must be anti-symmetric with respect to the electrons and also to the nuclei. Yeah? And this is very important. For instance, in this case, there are two, two families of states of H2, the ortho and para hydrogen, that can even be separated. And we can have a, a collection of molecules in which, for instance, having only um, states with uh, symmetric spin function and anti-symmetric space spatial function, and another box with molecules the other way around, eh? symmetric spin and symmetric spatial. Mm -hmm. But when can we consider that two nuclei are indistinguishable? In fact, they are indistinguishable when they can be interchanged in physically possible, feasible motions of the molecule. For instance, the two hydrogen nuclei in the H2 molecule can be interchanged by a rotation. If we are in gas phase, rotations are free, so there is no way to differentiate the two nuclei. Same for CH4. Same for this uh, methyl benzene or toluene, me parece que es. No, si, sí? me parece que si. Sí. <laughs> My organic chemistry is very oxidada. Um, in this case, in fact, we have a benzene ring with a CH2. And if this were in a fixed conformation, uh, we could differentiate maybe the hydrogens by their positions. But at usual temperatures, the rotation about this single bond is very easy. And so, in practice, is not, it is not possible to differentiate between the three hydrogens to label them. And so, we must consider them indistinguishable. But, for instance, in this molecule, this is a molecule with two H hydrogens here, here a chlorine, and here a bromine. 
Here, we can label the hydrogens. We can say, OK, this is the hydrogen. Hydrogen 1 is the one that is closer to chlorine. And hydrogen 2 is the one that is closer to bromine. And the positions cannot be interchanged without bronchine bonds. So at least at normal temperatures, we can completely differentiate between these two nuclei. And so we have not to bother about anti-symmetrizing the complete wave function with respect to exchange of these two particles. If we were at very high temperature, and then the molecule in the normal motions of the molecule could break the double bond and rotate one part with respect to the other, yeah, then this, the, this and the, well, the two hydrogen would, be, uh, would not be distinguishable. So in the case of molecules, we have to take this into account in order to know if we have to apply or not the indistinguishability of the particles. Well, for the case of polyelectronic systems, uh, a usual way of expressing the state of um, an electron system is by introducing an operator, which is the anti-symmetrizer, that is defined this way, which is a projection operator. In fact, is the operator that projects onto the uh, anti-symmetric subspace. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it can be verified that this is self-adjoint and is impotent, and so it's a projection operator. And so, uh, since this was the way of expressing the anti-symmetrized state vectors, we can put it as the anti-symmetrizer, and then we have to multiply to have by the square root of the n factorial in order to have a normalized state. It is interesting to write the states that way, because uh, in that way, by using the properties of projection operators, it's very easy to demonstrate many properties of the Slater determinants. For instance, you know that the scalar product of two Slater determinants uh, is zero unless they have exactly the same uh, spin orbitals. Huh? By using this notation, this is very straightforward to see. Yeah, we put one Slater determinant and the other. And then we take, for instance, this anti-symmetrizer A. And since it's a projection, this operator is Hermitian and can be put here. And then we have the product of two anti-symmetrizers since it is idempotent, we can put it as a single anti-symmetrizer. And so we have an anti-symmetrizer, which is this sum, and here a single product. Um, well, no. <laughs> well, in fact, I have, I have done it the other way around. Eh? I have taken. I have taken this anti-symmetrizer and put it together with this one. And then the, the sum, I have put it outside the scalar product. And so it is clear that here I have a permutation of this product, and I have the main permutation here. And the only way, since the, the, this scalar product is a scalar product of two tensor products of vectors, only when this is the same as this one, this is the same as this one, and this is the same as this one, only in this case we obtain a non-vanishing result. So it's rather straightforward to prove that these determinants are orthogonal. Well, and in fact, 
they are normalized if they are written in the same order. Eh? If, the, if we change, uh, if the, they have the same spin orbitals but with some ordering change, uh, then this could be minus one instead of one. But if we have the same ordering, they are orthonormal. Eh? Well, um, this can be used, for instance, to to prove the well-known Slater Condon rules that, and you will see this in another subject so I will not enter this question and well it's very straightforward to express for instance Hartifock energy by using the rules in terms of interest etc 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 but these are questions that will be dealt with in other subjects in the master and so I finish here the, the main part of my classes, which is the foundations of the, the postulates of the theory. And in the next day, we will speak of different types of representing those vectors and those operators, depending on the type of applications we will consider. Eh? Position representation, moment represent momentum representations, and many others. Well, if you have any question, and if not, I just finished in time. <laughs> Thank you very much, and try to do the exercise for Thursday. Mm -hmm.